With Half-Life 1 turning 25 years old in 2 months, you might be surprised to hear that there is still quite the active modding scene. And boy do they produce some quality content. Today we're talking about Half-Life Echoes. I'll be summarizing, analyzing and reviewing it and tell you all the little things that make me fall in love with it and why it is considered one of, if not the best Half-Life 1 mod there is. Also, it's much appreciated if you consider subscribing. 95% of you haven't yet. Half-Life Echoes released a total of 5 years ago now, with its latest version being released a total of 3 years ago in 2020. One might think that there is only so much you can do in a Half-Life 1 mod that keeps the people coming back to play them, but somehow these mods always manage to innovate. I distinctly remember playing this mod and thinking, wow, every so often, which you would not think you would do so long after the initial game's release. And even now, a total of 5 years after the mod's release, it still holds up. This video will be filled with spoilers, so if you want to play this mod for yourself, I highly recommend you doing so. Link is in the description. So let's get into it. The mod starts off with something that is similar to a G-Man cutscene. We see the Half-Life 1 test chamber and hear a quote that we heard from Eli in episode 2. Unforeseen consequences. The last time I heard those words was back at Black Mesa, when he whispered them in my ear. The whole world went to hell that day. When he brought in that crystal, I knew I... You know who I'm talking about. Our mutual friend. We then see a text saying Candidate 12. Status, evaluation commencing. This is followed by us hearing car sound, after which we take control of our character in an underground parking lot of Black Mesa. This immediately opens up a ton of questions that I will save for the end, as I love theorizing about the lore of mods. Now, an immediate note. This mod is overall pretty short. Depending on how thorough you are playing it, it will take you somewhere between 2-4 to four hours at most. But I'll have you know that these short 2-4 to four hours are filled with absolute greatness. This mod starts off with us simply getting to our workplace. As we wander around, we can see the Black Mesa facility already kinda breaking apart, which we also see in Half-Life 1. I was and am not sure if this is supposed to speak to the general jankiness that is the Black Mesa research facility, or if this is a fateful resonance cascade already taking effect in the past. This might sound dumb, but there is a real-life situation where this might actually be the case. I'm talking about the Hadron Collider. Every time they were about to do a big test on the Higgs particle, all the electronics would fail. Scientists speculate that this could be a future event having ripples back in time and stopping the test, as all electronics failing so often seems to be too much of a coincidence to actually be the case. Perhaps this is what we're seeing in Black Mesa falling apart. Alright, sorry for this tangent, let's get back to it. Now, even at this beginning bit where basically nothing is happening, there is so much to look at. This might be the most detailed iteration of Black Mesa I have seen in a Half-Life 1 mod. You can even go to the toilets and actually flush them. You actually see water. Oh, no way. No way! Fucking mod of the year! Flushable toilets? Furthermore, they experiment around with a few new environments. Like this for example. I'm pretty sure I've never seen this anywhere in Black Mesa. Or a room like this. It's completely new and also memorable environments and add a ton of character to this mod. This itchy area lasts for quite a while and I think it serves two purposes. For one, it helps expanding upon the cartoonish size of the Black Mesa research facility, which all mods basically inevitably do. But it also sets up for future maps of this mod, since you will eventually revisit most of these areas you see in the intro here, which is always great. Speaking more on the intro itself, they also went out of their way to add a lot of scripted sequences to stuff like jumping on a table. Hey, step off, buddy. Which, of course, people would find this irritating. Them actually responding, though, is so awesome. I think adding all this life to this place has one big purpose, though, which is you enjoying it. Which might sound obvious, like what other purpose do you design a game for than for people to enjoy it? What I'm specifically talking about though is enjoying the people and the not loneliness. You obviously know what's going to happen and right now you're getting a final glimpse of life and peace before the test is about to take place. You also see the G-Man talking to two scientists who confirm that they have delivered the test sample of his. The sample was just delivered to the test chamber. Which by the way, the G-Man is the one who delivered the sample on that fateful day in case you didn't know. The G-Man scene here is also swapped for the one from Half-Life 2. which adds a unique creepiness to him. Something about hyper-realistic things and bad graphics environments does something with your brain. Take for example that one Spongebob episode that all of us disturbed back then. Is it too late to go back inside yet? It's too late. We start moving down an elevator accompanied by a scientist and a security guard with an HEV suit. Which is a pretty cool concept never seen before. This mod does another great thing here. It plays with our expectations. We ride down an elevator at which point the power goes out and we hear the security guard screaming around. You might expect this to be the start of the alien invasion. Well, it turns out, he was just backing a crowbar against the controls in order to start the elevator again. And the power going out was just that, the power going out. 
which is a fun play on expectations that can really only be done in this exact situation. Also another great detail is that you can follow the scientist right here and see what he actually does. This does simply result in this easter egg. To go on another huge tangent here, the fact that they added you being able to follow the scientists is so incredibly nostalgic for me. I used to play this game called Lego Extreme Stunts. The game is basically about being a stuntman and filming a movie. I was never able to beat the game as a child. I simply enjoyed moving around and watching the characters. Each of them had a unique schedule that they followed and you could truly watch them move around the island. So yeah, being able to follow the scientists made me incredibly happy. Now getting back on track. Shortly afterwards, the Resonance Cascade does actually take place and we get to experience it greatly. We see the facility falling apart and get a first glimpse of something that is not does that few others actually do, which is realistic destruction in the form of pre-planned sequences. Watch this train get absolutely mollywopped by a falling piece of debris. Shortly afterwards, a Gagantua teleports in from Zen. He grabs and throws our tram away. This is where the mod starts and the intro ends basically. We see ourselves get dragged away from the tram. We see quite a lot of survivors, even saw seen earlier in the intro. Once we take control though, they are nowhere to be found. Also, I've been saving this point up until now, but one thing this mod does that I think makes it so memorable is playing with lights. And specifically, the color of lights. Most mods usually go for white lights and maybe occasionally a red light. This mod is so incredibly colorful throughout its environments, playing with deep blues and greens and pinks. I think this is part of what makes it stand out across other mods, and I think you'll notice it while watching this video as well. Now back to the mod itself. In the following first about 10 to 50 minutes we get no weapons at all. This helps create a sort of horror environment. It also introduces a new entity to us that is moving through the vents. We hear its loud shriek that actually scared the hell out of me while playing. Another great thing this mod does is pay off its great setup of dynamic characters at the start. First, we were cradled in the piece that is a thriving Black Mesa. Lots of people everywhere and most of them actually interactable and pretty dynamic depending on what you were doing. Then we are now thrown in a horror survival act situation. First with no weapon at all and later merely a crowbar. Now in this third act, the payoff, this mod plays really well with loneliness. Groups of people get dangled in front of our eyes, either somewhere inaccessible or somewhere that gets made inaccessible once we are about to reach them. When we finally do reach them, we find them dead. This is a great concept and has us yearning for some kind of human contact. Basically what all Hearthive fans do anyways. Getting back to the scary vent creature, only shortly afterwards do we get revealed as to what this creature is. In a goofy scene where a zombie throws a whole barrel at us. Now if you don't recognize what this creature is from this image alone, you must be new here. This creature is called Mr. Friendly and is a cut enemy of Half-Life 1. I think it was cut for the better. As it turns out, this creature's main way of attacking was, uh, sexually assaulting its victims. Yeah, maybe not the best idea for an enemy. Nothing of that is to be seen in this mod though. It's just here for creepiness. We actually move through vents that are visibly inhabited by it. Then we fall directly in front of it in mod scene, which leads to us having to run away. You'll notice that this enemy never has any direct moment of attacking or anything. This is due to it having no actual AI. As the background footage continues on through the Black Mesa environments this mod created, I'm gonna speak on the weapons very quickly. The arsenal is a little smaller than that of Half-Life 1. The weapons themselves aren't changed too much besides for some new sounds. Sounds that I actually think are great. Here, have a listen! This mod also has its fair share of puzzles. I think these are generally well balanced and pretty clever. As someone who plays a lot of Half-Life mods, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, there is a pattern in the puzzles of Half-Life mods. I think the puzzles are split up into a few categories. We've got what I'm gonna harshly call other original puzzles, which do serve their purpose, but they mostly involve pushing a crate to climb a ledge or turning a valve to disable steam or something similar to that. And then every mod got their fair share of unique puzzles. It's ones that take a new spin on original mechanics and invent a new type of puzzle. I'm generally surprised how seemingly easily mod makers still manage to create fully unique puzzles and mods. We also meet this person that uses the Black Mesa voice system to talk to us, which I thought was incredibly creative. He sadly also dies right before we reach him. 
We later arrive in this parking lot area in which we see Gus. Yes, THE Gus. He was also briefly seen in the intro, but I think saving this reveal up until now was better for the video. Gameplay-wise though, it made more sense if we saw him earlier as well. Gus says that he's stuck in there and that we need a security guard in order to open the doors. And thus we go search for one. Gus also talks to us using the monitors around the facility. Now, I respect the effort, but this does look pretty funky. Essentially, Half-Life 1 doesn't have a camera and monitor system the way Half-Life 2 does. This means in order to do this in Half-Life 1, the screen is literally just a hole in the wall with Gus placed inside of it. This makes it so the image has parallax. If you don't know what parallax means, here you go. I think they could have opted to just using a glitchy flat texture of him, just moving his mouth or something, as to make it flat and a bit more realistic. But then again, it adds a sort of charm to it that I like. Also, there is this scene. On our way to find a security guard, we walk through this tunnel and see the military arrive in a pretty grandiose set piece. I think this is the best looking arrival of theirs I have seen yet in a mod. Shortly afterwards we fight this unique enemy, which consists of a glowing alien grunt. I'm not entirely sure what the law behind these guys is. If we look closely, we see it pull the elevator doors towards itself. Perhaps this fella has absorbed the powers of whatever ended up being the basis to create a gravity gun. Whatever the case may be, he made for an interesting mini boss fight essentially just having more health. We eventually take an elevator and see a flying Zen crystal in a very pinkly lit area. We then get into a very interesting cutscene once we approach this crystal. Cleverly done, but you're not supposed to be here. Back where you belong and forget about all this until we meet again. What you just saw there was a kingpin. Kingpins are another cut enemy. Not a lot is known about them. They would have used psionic attacks. That is pretty much everything. By the way, if you want to see a video where I showcase cut half of enemies, let me know. In this mod, the kingpins seem to be some kind of powerful being similar to G-Man. I will save for the discussion about what we just saw for later though. We also find our first actual companion here, which is the HEV security guard seen in the intro. It's nice to finally find an actual companion, and with it a security guard to help free Gus. On our way back to Gus, we have another run-in with Mr. Friendly and find another scientist. And also the guy with the shotgun we saw earlier, dead in the same toilet. Want to get back to Gus and get the door open? Nice. <laughs> we find Gus killed by Black Ops. Shortly after which we see both the scientist and security guard killed by the military. We hear the soldiers exclaim. The HEV suit made them believe it was him. They disappointingly come to the realization that this was not actually Freeman. Storming in comes the Gargantua seen in the intro. We then battle a ton of soldiers, a tank and a Gargantua. All of this taking place right in the middle of that huge area we saw in the intro. Another thing that I briefly mentioned earlier is the destruction. Now for a game that has no real physics engine besides box pushing, the things achieved here through custom animations are astounding. There are the giant destruction scenes which are great in its own right and also more detailed than most mods probably would have done it, but we also got these very small destruction sequences here, like later on in the mod here. Once we shoot this gas canister, the railing next to it breaks as well. It's such a small detail that you might not even actively notice, but this stuff is so incredible. Once we beat all of these enemies, the final cutscene begins. Now, this final cutscene is all just story, so let me quickly get into the Lord. Now nah, I'm retiring that bit. Let's get into the lore discussion of all of this. I will get into my final review afterwards. My biggest question would be who the hell we are. We are never really given a clue on this. I think the best bet would be that we are a security guard. Then again, this weird promotional poster has a scientist on it. But I don't know how official this poster is, as I could only find it on the Half-Life Extended Universe wiki. 
But really, that is neither here or there, and not really what I'm asking about. We could be a forklift driver like Gus for all I care. What I really wonder is why we see these visions. Now for one, we heard Eli talking and saw the test chamber right before the resonance cascade happened. As a matter of fact, we heard Eli quotes from the future. Then we got to see the G-Man talking to both Gordon and Adrian Shepard in that one sequence with the Zen Crystal. The Kingpin also seems to have some sort of interest in us. Why though? Why are we showing these things? What specifically have we as Candidate 12 done that gives us this status? And I have you know that the final cutscene also doesn't give us the answer to this. And really, I don't even have a theory. Let me quickly show you what happens in the final cutscene. Prepare for unforeseen. Actually, before I do that, let me tell you about the story of Epistle 3. Epistle 3 was a letter published by Mark Laidlaw in 2017. Mark Laidlaw being one of the main writers of the Half-Life series, who has since retired. He says that this is a fanfiction, though it is immediately very obvious that in reality, he's telling the story that he envisioned for Half-Life 3 slash Episode 3. And there are probably really detailed tellings of it out there. Let me give you the very short version. Eli dead, we search Borealis, we find Mossman at Borealis, Alex kills her, Borealis flies towards the Combine world and will explode shortly, though Gordon realizes it won't do anything that actually hurts the Combine, Alex gets plucked out of there by the G-Man and Gordon gets saved by the Vortigons. Depending on which of the multiple endings Mark Laidlaw gave, Gordon either finds himself on a beach in the future and nobody remembers him, or back in time right before boarding the Black Mesa tram on that fateful day. The end. Also quick disclaimer, Mark Daigler says he regrets posting this and says it's not official, in case that wasn't clear yet. Now, with this knowledge in mind, we first see the G-Man whisper prepare for unforeseen consequences in Eli's ear. Then we see the Borealis with Alex, Gordon, the G-Man and a dead Mossman on board, heading towards the Combine Dyson Sphere. We then hear Eli mention his wife and where they were living, at which point we get placed in front of the Black Mesa housing. We hear Eli say, I can still only guess what might have happened to my wife. After this, the G-Man is seen standing over a cradle, looking over a crying baby. He teleports in front of us. We then hear alarms go off. The kingpin approaches and takes the baby with it. The baby that can only be presumed to be Alex. G-Man seems annoyed by this and says, Come back here now. We walk outside again, where we see the Zen crystal. It turns red and spins violently. The kingpin appears for a short moment and says, What the hell have you done? The G-Man, happy with himself, says, Oh no, not this time. And tells us to prepare for unforeseen consequences. Right at this moment, we see the nuclear explosion go off. In what is probably the best looking rendition of it I have seen in a Half-Life 1 mod. Our outcome being subject unsuitable for employment. And the reason being? Candidate 12 demonstrated keen ability but was susceptible to external influence. I mean, fair enough. We also get to see the status of other candidates. Candidate number 1 has been extracted, number 3 has been hired and number 7 has been detained. If we had to take an educated guess, candidate number 1 is Alex, number 3 is Freeman and number 7 is Adrian Shepard. Now what the hell does all of this mean? I enjoy the backstory being told here, the actual scene of G-Man plucking Alex out of Black Mesa. It's also interesting to see Alex being so important that she got the candidate number 1 label. Up until this time step, Half-Life Alex spoilers will be happening. Skip ahead or mute the video and look away from the subtitles to not be spoiled. Alright, you have been warned, here we go. Half-Life Alex spoilers! Alex being candidate number one makes sense given what we saw in Half-Life Alex. The G-Man has great interest in her. What I do find to be a weird decision though is showing the Epistle 3 ending. As this ending is made impossible by the ending of Half-Life Alex. I know I'm already in the spoiler zone, but I know some guy watching didn't notice so I'm only giving him a half spoiler. Okay, spoilers are over now, you can now watch again. Let's get to my final review. Overall, I think Half-Life Echoes is a masterpiece with a clear love to the craft that is very noticeable when playing. The amount of scripted sequences everywhere make it the best iteration of Black Mesa I have seen yet in a Half-Life 1 mod. Hell, I'd even say it's the best I've ever seen, topping that of Black Mesa the Half-Life 1 remake. Which, speaking about Black Mesa, there is currently a project that is aiming to remake Half-Life Echoes on Black Mesa, simply called Candidate 12. I'll link it in the description. It is far from done, but also not cancelled as of making this video, which is always great to hear. Back to my Half-Life Echoes review though. The thing I appreciate most about this mod is its colors. It is very visually pleasing and is probably its most discerning factor from other mods. The reworked weapon sounds are pretty nice. The brought back enemies are cool to see and it generally has an endearing story, even if the question on who the hell the protagonist is is left open. Giving this mod anything other than a 10 out of 10 would be a disservice. So yeah, consider subscribing and becoming a channel member. Otherwise, thank you for watching. That smell is interesting. I hope that odor isn't coming from you.